The question is, how do we best deal with disruptive students in our classrooms? And those of us who have been teaching online or traditional college courses for any length of time have certainly had our share of disruptive students. And one thing we may know for sure is that all it takes is one disruptive student to derail a class and drain the joy right out of teaching. Well, here are two thoughts as we begin. The first thought is this rule of business success, according to Bob Lutz, who's vice president of product development at General Motors. And he says disruptive people can be essential to the creative process because they stir things up and they question and they irritate and they move things out of balance and out of the center. And he says to remember that that's where creativity happens is on the edges. And creativity is what we're looking for, certainly in our work as educators. So disruption in a classroom is not necessarily a bad thing. A second thought is that disruptive people are everywhere, certainly not just in our classrooms. It's a fact of life. And much of my professional experience has been working with disruptive and disrupted people. So I'll briefly share some tactics from the differing perspectives and modes of an educator, a crisis counselor, and a corrections officer, which are all jobs that I've held. But if there is one common guideline or prime directive I've found, it's this is that disruptive people should be kept from harming themselves and others. And there's a line where creative disruption becomes destruction. And that we simply can't allow, where disruption no longer creates but destroys classroom productivity. Another guideline that proves to be generally true is the 2080 rule. And that's where just 20% of the students will take up 80% of our time and energy. And for me, it's not the time factor so much. It's the energy where just five minutes of a problem student can ruin my whole day. And not all disruptive students will be the bad students. Sometimes it's the best students who disrupt the class. It may be the overachievers with their questions, clarifications, resubmits on already A-graded papers, and their arguments with the accuracy of textbook materials and excessive expectations on an instructor's time. One disruptive student I had was always fastidiously nitpicking at ambiguities in the materials. And actually, this helped to clarify the materials, especially for my first time teaching the course, which supports Bob Lutz saying that disruptive people are sometimes an asset. Now, sometimes we may get a warning, but disruptions often arise suddenly with a bang in a crisis. This has been a big year for crisis situations around the world. Part of what I do is to provide consultation in crisis communications. And over the past years, I've been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal and Inc. Magazine and Sacramento Bee and others looking for crisis communication secrets. But there really is no big secret to dealing with crises, just common sense. And the first rule of crisis communications is to work as a control rod and absorb radioactivity before a situation goes meltdown. And just a few well-timed and well-stated communications can accomplish this, calming the environment. And actually, those of of us who teach online may have a better since dealing with a disruptive student can be easier online than in on-ground classrooms. In a live, traditional classroom setting, we need to deal with a student right then and there. In an asynchronous online environment, we can count to 100 or go for a walk, and we can let it sit for a day or ask our coach or the instruction team for advice. Then we can come back and deal with it later with a cooler head. Now, another rule of crisis intervention is to deal with problems while they're small, before they spin out of control. And we, could, we should always be watching for the warning signs. Unfortunately, that's easier said than done. We can't deal with every single little problem that may blow up, but who has the time to do that? And it often takes experience to recognize the ticking time bombs. And the most common way to get that experience is simply to go through a crisis or two. But we can watch for incremental escalation. And here's what we may see. Most conflicts start small and end very fast. What may indicate a looming meltdown is when we see escalating tensions or hostilities when they should be diminishing over time. 
Now, maybe the escalations happen in small increments, but those are increments upward rather than downward. So we watch the trends and patterns with a well-honed sense of what's going to rear up and bite us. I suggest three modes of intervention with disruptive students, which we'll look at in a little detail. And these modes are in an escalating series, starting with the most common and the easiest. And the first is the educator mode. And that's where we ask, how can we turn this disruptive situation into a learning experience? Then there's the counselor mode, and that's where we dig a little deeper to seek out well, what is the root problem here and what might help fix this ongoing or this chronic issue. And then there's the corrective mode, and that's where the class is derailed. Other students are disrupted, and the offending student needs to be reined in. And we say, this ends right here, right now, for the good of the class. Of course, your approach has, has to mesh with your own personal style, and you can't pretend to be something you're not, but we can use some general tactics and techniques. And starting with the educator mode, now some of the most common forms of conflicts in an online class will be in the discussion boards. And that's where students can be quick to meet the posting requirements, but may not think them through carefully. And they can create discord with an unintentionally thoughtless post. And what we can do in this case is simply to ask for clarification or restatements on sloppy posts. Also, some students seem to thrive on Discord, and their idea of creativity is to create turmoil. And that's just too easy. We shouldn't accept that as a level of performance. And certainly this is where a course can quickly spin out of control without instructor intervention. Now we can also ask them to research and argue the other side's position in, in an attempt to deflect the discord into other avenues. And if they find that to be too objectionable, we can at least ask them to detail what the other side's arguments might be. Whatever it takes to get them to loosen the grip on their rigid opinions and expand their perspective some. And that's what education should be, is to open our mind to new possibilities. And we can always use our instructor's discretion to assign a related task. For example, once I had a rather heated student conflict in a journalism course as they spun off on a tangent about whether people have the right to feel sympathy for the followers of a tyrant such as Hitler or Saddam Hussein. And this was passionately argued by two students, both with families who had been imprisoned and exterminated in concentration camps. And the postings were getting increasingly heated and hostile over more than a week. And it was certainly disrupting the flow of the course. And here's a couple of uh, excerpts from their exchange. Student number one saying there were Nazi Germans who were saddened by Hitler's suicide. And student number two angrily responding that most of my family died at the hand of Hitler and the Nazis. And I don't really need a lecture on that. And it just got increasingly heated and hostile over the course of the week. So to redirect the focus toward an educational end, I offered the two students the opportunity to write an op-ed piece for their local newspapers and even offered them course credit for the task since it was a journalism class. And both of them wrote and submitted pieces and the discussion changed to how to write an op-ed and how to submit it and how to get it published towards a much more educational end. Now, moving on towards the counselor mode, here's something I learned over a couple of years as a university crisis counselor is that often people are just looking for a sympathetic ear and will go to extremes to find it. One of the most powerful but short sentences in a counselor's arsenal is simply to say, I hear you. And sometimes you don't even need to say anything beyond that since that's all they're really looking for. Next is to let the student vent a little and to relieve the pressure. Now, it doesn't need to be an especially deep or lengthy conversation. It can't be. We don't, we don't have the time nor necessarily the expertise to offer that. But we can let the student detail any frustrations in a faculty one-to-one -one message and take it out of the discussion room and then respond as well as we possibly can. Now, the problem could be as simple as relieving some of the insecurities and defensiveness of an older re-entry student, which many of them are. And I was an older returning student, and I'll sometimes let them know that, that I understand how intimidating it can be. 
And to us, they may be just another student working through the program, but what they really are is a person looking to make for themselves a better life, and perhaps they're recovering from some catastrophic event, such as the loss of a job or a divorce, or trying to reestablish an identity. And most of us can somehow relate to that, and sharing a bit of our own example with the student can be very effective. Of course, quite often the student's needs go beyond our abilities or availability, and that's why college and university advisors are there to help deal with that. But still, we can often relieve the impacts of a disruptive student, perhaps a fearful student, by simply, simply letting them vent a little and, again, simply saying, you know, I hear you, which can be remarkably effective. Moving on again into the corrections mode. Sometimes people reach a point in antisocial behavior where educating or counseling them simply doesn't work, and they need a good dose of reality therapy to let them know just where the limits are, that beyond a certain point, a wall comes crashing down and they're removed from normal society. Now, my job for the Oregon Department of uh, Corrections, however brief, was to do a, an intake risk assessment of felon probationers and parolees. What kind of threat did they pose to the community? Now, if people want to destroy themselves, there's not much we can do about that, but we do owe it to the community to protect them against threats and disruption. Starting with defining the limits and enforcing them. And we need to do the same in our classroom. We cannot allow one student to derail the learning of others. And sometimes a disruptive student simply needs to bounce against the limits of the program. And that's where we need to make sure our sense of mercy is balanced by a sense of justice and what's right. Sometimes as instructors, we may be a little softer in our approach, granting students greater latitude than they may find in the working world or society at large. This isn't always a favor. Yes, we should be supportive and compassionate, but for the student's sake and the well-being of the classmates, we need to have clearly defined limits and not go beyond those. And that's only fair to everyone in the course, and it's ultimately in the best interest of the students who may be pushing to see just how far the rules can be stretched. And balance the interests of one with the interests of the group. For example, one minor example. A student was facing an upcoming hospital stay, and she was working fast ahead on her tasks. And I accommodated her, to disrupting my own flow and forcing me to prepare materials for a new class a week or more in advance. But then she asked to have a team assigned to her in advance, and that I declined, since that would impose on other students who were preoccupied with their current tasks. And of course, call for backup when needed. And it's not always clear just what to do, or for that matter, even just what a problem is. And that's where an instruction team or deans or coaches and mentors are there to help. And typically, they're so sympathetic and supportive with some detached objectivity on what may be a disruptive model. I believe there's a clarifying power to naming something. It helps to get a handle on what a problem might be. Now, some disruptive behavior can be attributed to what others have called the mad student syndrome. I use angry student syndrome for the cool anagram. And that's where students may be unhappy with a grade, but rather than consider it as some fault of their own, they turn it back on the instructor or the course materials or their classmates as the real poor performers, and often they do it publicly in the classroom discussions and forums. And this is when strong police action is required and the walls drop down. Students should not be allowed to pollute the learning environment of others, and these angry student situations are typically evident for what they are. So here's a summary overview of how to deal with disruptive students. First, to address the problems while they're small. Recognize the trouble signs such as incrementally escalating conflicts. And then to work as a control rod and absorb the radioactivity in a classroom when necessary. And then seek ways to turn conflict into learning, maybe assigning a research project or perhaps having them work in a team. And then help the students feel connected. And remember, simply saying, I hear you can be three very powerful words. 
Also, set the limits. Once people know where the walls are, they'll often stop pushing and know when to lower the boom, and we have a duty to protect the learning environment of our students. Finally, stay in contact with your coaches and mentors and your instruction support team and your deans and department heads. And that's what they're there for, and they may be able to help you deal with some of the pressures before you melt down and turn into a disruptive instructor, and that's a different topic. I'm sure I've missed some uh, good tips. If you have some you'd like to share, send me an email and perhaps we can include them in future presentations.